polling now and see what is it that we will talk about next time. So the topic that just barely edged out others is perfectionism. So this, this topic was a runner up, I think twice. So next month we will talk about, let me share the results with you if you care to see them. Next month, we will talk about perfectionism and skin picking. And so without any further ado, let's go um, to the Q&A. Oh, one more thing that I would like to say. Um, uh, there's a, there's a, this, I always forget to say this. So there's a discount coupon. If you join in the next seven days, you get a $60 discount from your first month in the program. So just keep in mind that you need at least two to complete the, the main part of the program. How many people are typically on these? Uh, I have no idea, to be honest. Like currently there's like 120 people. There were more in the beginning and also people come and go. So we had up to, I don't know, 400 and something people on the, on the webinar. So there's quite a number of people attending. I hope that helps. A uh, proposal of new topic for next month, masochism and the feeling of enjoying pain. Okay, I'm going to write this down in my notes that I don't forget. And then I will put it in the, in the poll next month so you can, you can choose it. Why is skin picking so soothing? I hope that I answered this question during the webinar, but I will reiterate my answer briefly because skin picking allows you to channel all the kind of excitement that negative experiences bring along with them without actually having to process them. So you use up all the energy for, for picking, and then you gently allow yourself to float away from everything that you don't want to face. So that would be the, the short version of the answer. Why do you assume there are more avoidant behaviors? Well, because avoidant behaviors are really very human. Perhaps there's absolutely nothing else that you, you employ to avoid things. I mean, good for you if that's the case. But I recognize these behaviors in many different, like it's not just people who struggle with picking or I don't know, pulling or depression or whatever. It's something that we all do all the time. It's just that it's not always a problem. Like I even gave you a few examples of when I avoid things and not all of these examples or not all, all these examples are signs of, I don't know, mental illness. It's just human behavior. I think the difference is whether or not avoiding behavior is something you use constantly or occasionally and whether or not it, like there's always a cost benefit analysis to any type of behavior. And once that kind of flips to the cost side, I think that's where it becomes a problem. So yeah, that's, our psyche tends to be very lazy. And if we cannot change, we're very likely to opt for that spontaneously. So that's why I assume that. Uh, skin picking feels safe. It allows time to reflect and offer sensation. Yeah. There's, uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with this. I assume that this was from the beginning of the webinar when I talked about why is it that people choose something that also causes pain. There's a, there's a concept in, in psychoanalysis uh, of psychic shelter, which is like this very bad place that you go to, but you go there because it's safe. And I absolutely think that picking can serve that purpose sometimes. Uh, how do you relate this to a client experiencing trauma? Using skin picking to soothe as an ongoing addiction. Well, I wouldn't call skin picking addiction, but yes, I know what you mean, why you, why you say that, because of the way that it kind of feeds itself and you need more and more. And also because it offers short-term relief, so you kind of need more of it with time. It does share these things with how we see addiction. Uh, I think skin picking and hair pulling sometimes have to do with trauma, but the relationship is really very complex. Actually, I'm going to put this down as a topic for maybe one of the one of the future webinars because I feel like it, it's an important topic, but it's very hard to summarize in, in two sentences. Uh, but yes, there's a, there's even research to suggest uh, that using these avoidant patterns uh, tends to make PTSD, uh, whether or not you're formally diagnosed, but any kind of reaction to trauma more intense and and more difficult to handle. Precisely because of even what I described with my friend, but boredom obviously is in you know, trauma, but like the more you kind of avoid, the scarier the, the, what you're avoiding becomes. So if you're avoiding memories, the more you avoid them, the, the more difficult they become to handle. So experiential avoidance can actually 
uh, cause quite a bit of problems if you try to process trauma. Can you see us? Uh, no. Uh, one of the reasons why we do these questions in writing and why I cannot see, well, first of all, there's too many of you to see at the same time. And second of all, it's because uh, I even asked in one of the webinars about this and people feel more comfortable writing questions than actually saying them because you preserve your anonymity. I can't see, for most of you, I can't see your names and I'm never gonna read them anyway, if, even if I see them. Uh, I spent so long avoiding my emotions and real life experiences by picking, daydreaming, watching TV, etc., that I don't really feel them anymore. Uh, we had to put my dog down last week uh, and even though she grew up with me and has been a part of my life for over 12 years, I don't really feel the grief that I should feel. I know that I should feel it, but I just don't. Uh, continue. My therapist wants me to work on sitting with my emotions instead of escaping from them. But how do I sit with something that I no longer feel? Well, this is a very good question. And I think it kind of shows like the extreme to which avoidant behaviors can bring you. I don't think you can invoke your emotions overnight. And also I think you shouldn't specifically. Um, let's just stay at the level of the obvious. If you're avoiding emotions, well, that's because you can't handle them. If you avoided them so much that you have no contact with them anymore, it's because you can't handle them. So what I would suggest is that you try a very slow step-by-step -step process. Uh, maybe since you have a therapist, I assume you work in some sort of face-to-face -face therapy. Uh, maybe you can work on kind of stopping or slowing down in therapy, allowing you to, to feel just a little bit or learn teaching you how your therapist can teach you sort of how to focus on different parts of your body and then follow them. I recently had a session with a client who was really surprised to, to, to learn that, that you can actually follow your emotions in your body and that you know, like, like when your stomach turns, that means something. When your legs become restless, that means something. So that's also another way that you can approach your emotions. But whatever you do, it should really be, I would, I'm hesitant to suggest so like practicing mindfulness because I don't, sometimes when people struggle with trauma, especially with complex PTSD, mind, mindfulness is really useful, but it needs to be introduced very slowly and in small bites and by a therapist who's actually also a practitioner so that they don't do more harm than good. But for example, if, if that's something you can do, you can try just practicing, let's say body scans or focusing on being with positive sensations from in the start, because I assume that you, you can at least feel some positive emotions. So one way to sit with emotions is also to sit with positive emotions, even though it doesn't seem very intuitive, even if you learn how to be with and observe and, and be mindful of, let's say, happiness, that slightly increases your levels of tolerance because both positive and negative affect, when it's intense, cause the same kind of stress. It's just that we only have bias towards one part of the spectrum and not towards the other. So even if you focus on the good stuff, you are also learning how to tolerate more intensity. So slowly you will tune into these uh, more negative emotions, but it has to be very slow. Otherwise you will just kind of reinforce the, the avoidance patterns. Hi there. I just wanted to ask, I've not been picking for several months, waiting list for CBT for four months, uh, getting to recognize the triggers uh, and what to do to stop hours of picking. I may touch one, but the picking episodes are very few now. Uh, is CBT a lot of written work? Well, I, to my knowledge, there's no wait list for a skin pick. So I assume you're in some other program. Uh, when it comes to skin pick, there is a lot of written work because that's the primary form of communication. But if you have face-to-face -face CBT, then most of it will not be written work. It will be communication with the therapist. However, all forms of CBT, skin pick included, involve assignments. So chances are if you're even like even when I don't do cognitive therapy, when I just go with my constructivist instincts, I like to give clients some type of assignment, something to work because that keeps them engaged and it doesn't limit change or introspection to just our session. So you're very likely to have something to do all the time and that may include written work, but it doesn't have to. Uh, different therapists can create different strategies for working. So the best thing to do is to see with whoever your therapist will be 
you know, how they work. Oh, and also you can just go to the therapy and say, I don't want to do homework. I don't have time or I can do only this type of homework. There are people who don't express themselves well in writing and your therapist, if that's the case with you, your therapist should be flexible enough to change things. Is speaking from your experience always, a, is speaking from my experience always a precursor to picking? Uh, well, if, if you're asking me what I just read that you're, oh, okay, so there's a correction below. Sorry, is avoidance always a precursor to picking? Um, so avoidance is a rather general mechanism, so I can safely say yes. Um, but sometimes I find that clients react better when we, when we rephrase it and call it, let's say, a way of emotional processing, because it doesn't always feel like avoidance especially when we talk about mindless or automatic picking, because that's something that you just find yourself doing. So it's much, and usually like you're watching TV and then you suddenly see that you're picking or I don't know, talking to someone and then you catch yourself picking. Because you're engaged in something else, you don't really pay attention to whatever's sort of boiling beneath the surface. So it kind of feels automatic, but it really, there's always a trigger for it. And then there's also another aspect, which is that when something becomes a habit, like someone else describes, it becomes so automatic that you don't really feel the whole cycle of it. So like the, the, the person that mentioned not being sad because of, of because their dog dying. I mean, as a dog owner, I, I, mean, I, I could cry just thinking about my, my dog not, not being eternally alive. Uh, so it's it's very intense, but when you constantly avoid you just it kind of blends into one mechanism and then you lose this idea that you're avoiding. Experientially, like it can really not feel like avoiding. It can feel like just a habit as people would say. But if it feels like just a habit, then the best way to look for triggers and what you're avoiding is by focusing on your thoughts and emotions. That's usually the, the fastest way to get to what's happening. Kind of like with my friend in boredom. He presented boredom as something just so mundane that it's like basically beneath him. And then five minutes of talking about it and you realize that he wants to jump out of his own skin, but because it's so difficult for him to be with that, he immediately jumps into work. And then with time, he disguises this into this lovely facade of just loving his job and, and just being a workaholic. But basically it is avoidance. Uh, so the point of therapy to better understand what your clients are trying to avoid. If you ask me personally, yes, but do I always do that with clients? No, because there are clients who come to therapy, skin pick included, and they say, look, I'm really not a fan of this thinking about myself thing. Uh, let's just do habit reversal training, find ways to replace picking and just you know, leave it there. I don't think that's like the ultimate solution, but eventually you know, clients change is up to the client. But if you ask me, yes, it would be the goal to understand what you're avoiding and also to find or at least map out vaguely how to stop avoiding and how to face these things. Uh, so what are they supposed to do when they're alone, isolated and depressed? How to pass the time safely? Uh, so I'm not sure I followed the question, but if 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 I feel like like if I assume that it's a continuation of the previous question because it doesn't say the name, uh, then dealing with loneliness and isolation and depression would be the primary thing. In that case, picking is secondary to all these issues. So that's, that's what should be addressed, presumably in therapy or even with medication. Is it common that people even avoid regular activities and hobbies I feel like I often won't even start doing things like playing the guitar, maybe because I'm worried I will get frustrated. I also feel like watching a movie I haven't seen or read something um, uh, or reading something is too much of an emotional investment. Yeah, you basically described emotional avoidance right there. So uh, you feel like you might be frustrated uh, because, you know, if you start playing the guitar. So you don't want to feel frustrated because it's obviously not a very pleasant experience. And then you start worrying about having to avoid frustration. So you just, you know, just stop and call the whole thing off. So yes, that, that right there is, is an avoidance mechanism. Uh, your explanation is not clear. Um, 
I, I, I'd be happy to explain again, but I'm not sure what this refers to. Uh, P.S. You're doing a phenomenal job, and because of these webinars, I will be signing up for therapy today. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome, and I'm very happy, and thank you for your compliments, and I hope the therapy goes well. Uh, very well explained, thank you. Well, apparently, I either explained it very well or I didn't, but I still don't know what. I will, however, thank you. Um, will the recording be shared somewhere? I'm, I, I unfortunately missed the beginning. Yes. Um, I suppose maybe on Friday or, or even maybe before, you will be getting a link uh, with the recording and presumably information about the other webinar for the presentation program. Uh, let's say I don't know how to access suppressed emotions. No one does, that's why they're suppressed. I mean, that's the definition of suppression, it means that it works. Um, I have anger instead of feeling my pain, and I don't even know how to really sit with pain anymore. Uh, how do I access that ability and find the part of me that holds pain? I can go to anger and resentment and hurt, but I won't be able to sit with pain so that it doesn't, so it stays suppressed and causes me problems. Thank you. I also have trichotillomania and I pick my skin, but I find pleasurable, not sure if it's avoidance. Uh, so I, if you go back to that cycle, the, the pleasurable aspect of it is what actually reinforces the, the whole cycle. So it's, it's a part of the picture, not all of it, but it's a part of it. And regarding suppressed emotions, so what I said jokingly about suppression working when you can't access them, that is true, except that what you're doing here is not necessarily suppression. So I'm not a psychoanalyst, so I'm reserving the right to not, to not be right in this case. Um, but when you suppress something, you don't know that you've suppressed it because you've suppressed it. That's the whole point of it. Like when you suppress a traumatic memory, it means you don't know that it happened for all, all Practical purposes, what's suppressed doesn't exist. However, if you actually feel pain, but what you express is anger, it kind of means that you turn the emotion upside down, if that makes sense. Like something that's very vulnerable, you turn into something that's manifestly powerful. Basically, what you do is you react the opposite from what you actually feel. Like I feel hurt, but I will lash out in anger. That's something I believe that's called reaction formation, when you just re react in the opposite way from what you actually really feel. I would invite you to think about what for you the implications of being in pain or being hurt are. What are the assumptions that you have around this? Like, what's the meaning of these emotions for you? That will tell you why this mechanism happens. And then the next step would be to learn first without other people, how to be with the hurt, like how to observe it very mindfully. Because if you remember hurt, no matter how intense it is, it's impermanent, so it will go away. And then once you learn how to observe it, you will A, be able to learn from it, B, be able to be non-reactive in the sense that you'll experience it, but you will not feel the need to lash out. Sometimes I know, and it could be, because all I know about you is this one paragraph. So I could, this could not very well apply to you. But I've seen very often that people will react in an angry way so that they don't communicate to others how hurt they are. So people will say, I don't care. But what they really mean is I don't care, coma, you broke my heart, you SOB, right? But that part is left unsaid because I don't care sounds powerful. And it sends a message in relationships is I'm unfazed by this or don't mess with me, I'm very powerful when we react in an angry way. And then one of your, some of the implicit content that I was talking about could actually lie in how, how this is understood interpersonally. Um, any man from Central or Eastern Europe can tell you that as long as you're sad, you should be really very angry because then people will think you're very, you're very macho, whereas really you're just a sad boy. But being macho is because is, is important to maintain because that care that places you somewhere in the social hierarchy and gives you certain power. So in that sense, that is the impression that you must leave. And then your implicit assumption is somewhere that you can't be a weakling who's a some sort of beta of something. Let's not use bad words. Instead, you must be angry. So that's the implicit assumption that kind of makes you convert your pain into, into anger. 
So finding this and then on a practical level, maybe working mindfully. There's even there's even a book if you're if you're interested in constructivism about working with anger. There's an article about that. It's called The Tuesday Club. I believe it was written by Peter Cummings and someone else, but I cannot remember. It's a big name in the constructivist world, but I cannot. I'm, I'm just, I feel ashamed that I cannot remember the name because I know the person. Um, so anyway, there's that. And then there's also a book about how to work with anger. And so that's the way to go. The, on, if, you, if you prefer something less technical and more pop psychology, maybe you can check out some of Brene Brown's books because she talks a lot about vulnerability and how to be kind of okay and open with, with pain and, and hurt and, and humiliation and rejection and all these touchy and difficult subjects. And she does so without invoking a lot of technical vocabulary, even though a lot of what she writes has been said by psychoanalysts a long time ago. Uh, my youngest daughter, now age 23 and master's degree, working as a therapist, I suppose for trichotillomania. She was also a chronic thumb sucker since she was born. When she finally gave it up in sixth grade for fear of being ridiculed, she began pulling out her hair, leaving bald spots. What is the connection? Is it a form of self-soothing? Yeah, so thumb sucking and hair pulling and skin picking they, they all fall into this group that we call BFRBs or body focused repetitive behaviors. So they all more or less, at least the way that, that we tend to understand them for most people is that they serve this purpose of self soothing And thumb sucking to a degree is a normal behavior for children and then kind of stays away if there's more need for self soothing So yes, I would say that you're right. That is a form of self soothing Although since she's 23 years old, I'm guessing that there's uh, like more complexity to that story since a lot of life experiences get attached to these strategies that we use. Um, are you saying to let go of all the responsibilities, just practice mindfulness to forget about holding our whole life together? Family dying, losing jobs, possession, possessions, health, the pandemic causing isolation and depression, a little picking can help. Well. Far be for me to tell you what to do. I mean, I, even though I'm a therapist, I'm really not in the business of telling people whether or not they should pick. If people want to stop picking, I can help. But if they don't, then, then they don't. Grownups have this ability to choose. But I, I, just regarding your first part is, I'm not saying that you should let go of all the responsibilities. Um, actually, I mean, the, the first half an hour, I was in my imagination, at least glorifying the, the notion of choice and personal responsibility. And I thought it might even be too much for everyone's taste. So I'm surprised that you see all of this. Being mindful doesn't mean being irresponsible. Mindfulness is a very integral part of my life. Like I've been meditating daily for 10 years now, maybe even more. And I practice mindfulness in at least an hour and a half every day. I meditated before this and I meditated this morning and I might do it again, but I'm still holding my life together. I have not forgotten about the fact that I have to eat, that I have to pay my bills, that people are mortal. To me, being mindful doesn't mean that you just leave everything going to a forest somewhere and then, I don't know, live off the sunlight. It just means being present with whatever's happening, just experiencing life to the fullest. Even the depression of COVID, just experiencing it, just being with it. To me, that's what mindfulness is. I see someone's raising a hand, but please, you can ask a question because hand raising, but I'm not sure what it communicates. So yeah, I'm definitely not saying to let go of all the responsibilities. But then I think just one point, I think that also tells you a little bit about how you construe things, like what constructs do you have? It's like either something or let go of everything. But these all or nothing constructs tend to be uh, quite stubborn sometimes. What I'm proposing is really to kind of rotate the whole axis. I'm proposing to just be with whatever and then see what the most constructive way is to solve the problem, not to abandon everything. Uh, at a couple of points during the webinar, I was reminded of schema therapy and acceptance and commitment therapy and wondering if these would be helpful. So uh, I don't know too much about schema therapy. I've read some stuff related to trichotillomania and skin picking and family therapy. So I know, like I know the basic ideas behind it. And yes, some of them are similar. And most of what I was talking, including 
experiential avoidance as an idea is from acceptance and commitment therapy. The reason why I'm using a lot of acceptance and commitment therapy is because, uh, well, first of all, uh, SkinPick is based on acceptance and commitment therapy in large part. So I feel like if I'm having these webinars for, in, let's say, in front of skin picking, is there representative? I should at least use the theory that is used in the program as well. And then also because I think it's like a very convenient way to talk about certain problems. Uh, so yeah, I use a lot of constructivism because that's basically how I see the world. And to me, Kelly's theory is by far the most beautiful theory I have ever seen. Like it's just magnificent. So I like to put a lot of it, but fundamentally, most of this is acceptance of commitment therapy. Yeah. I think a lot of these third wave CBT theories share certain assumptions. Uh, God bless you. Thank you for sharing so much with all of us. Oh, well, thank you. And you're very welcome. Uh, what if I feel as though I may be avoiding an experience or an emotion, but I'm not too certain what that experience emotion is? How can I gain clarity? Well, um, I think I answered your question partially before. I would caution you with one thing, though. I learned this from my own experience, and it was not the easy way. There was a period, because I trained in Europe. In Europe, essentially, you cannot really become a therapist unless you have a lot of your own experience as a client in therapy. So we go through something called didactic psychotherapy, which is like, I think the European Association for Psychotherapy has like at least 250 hours of psychotherapy. So it's like five years once a week or, and then individual training centers will sometimes even make you do more. And so there was a, there was a long time that I was in my own therapy. And um, like whenever you start, you think, well, I don't really have much to talk about. And then the more you talk about, the more you realize, you know, the, the kind of garbage that lives inside our minds. And so there was one period that I remember that was particularly challenging for me because every time in the session, I would feel like I'm talking about something incredibly important. Like I was fully aware as I was talking to my therapist that this is groundbreaking. But then as soon as I leave her office, as soon as I would leave the office, I would immediately forget what that was. It, it was truly almost like magic. Like when my clients describe that now, I know what they mean. But if I didn't have this experience, I don't know that I would have believed. It's genuinely like I would be like in tears talking about all these difficult things and then just close the door and all of it gone. And so what I did was I kind of tried to cheat my own defense mechanisms. Um, I would try to kind of summarize the session in the end and just repeat like the key phrases. But then as I would go out, it's like when you wake up from a dream and then you think you must remember this, but then as you try to memorize like the, the dream elements just leave. And then at one point, and this was, the moment when I finally learned my lesson after a couple of weeks, I decided that what I will do is by the end of the session, I will simply take like a notepad and just write things down. Like but one quick summary, like one sentence, of what is it I keep forgetting? So I brought a piece of paper. I asked my therapist, can I just have two minutes to write it down? And she kind of leaned into her chair and smiled and said, sure, write it down. You know, like those people that have some sort of annoying wisdom that they don't share well that way. And she was like, sure, write it down. So I did. I left the therapy room very happy because now I will have written record of, of what happened and what I was kind of forgetting and you know suppressing. And so I came home. I was kind of said hello to my dog. And so I was very happy to sit down, open the, the piece of paper and then read it. And then what happened is that I started looking for the piece of paper and realized that it's gone and it's not there anymore. And then suddenly I remembered that as I walked around the corner from my therapist's office, there was a trash can on the corner. And I thought, well, I have some stuff in my pockets that I didn't want to throw in the streets. So let me just do that now. So I took everything out along with the note, threw it in the trash and left. And that's when I realized that you cannot really cheat your defense mechanisms if they don't want to let something go through. And then the next week I went back to my therapist and said, oh my God, like you're not gonna believe what happened. And she said, oh, of course it happened. Like, what did you think was gonna happen? Like, even if you didn't throw away the paper, you would probably have written down something that wouldn't make sense anymore. And she said, how about you trust your mind that it will let things go through when the time comes? 
And sure enough, in a month or two, I was really, and I mean, I'm not going to share what it is, but I was kind of able to remember it. And now when I think back, I think, well, that wasn't a big deal, but it obviously was a big deal because my mind put a lot of effort to block me from these memories. So in these situations, it's patience and it's working with the little crumbs that you can remember or that you get. But you don't need fast clarity if it's something that's so dangerous, uh, dangerous under quotation marks, if it's something that, that you feel so intensely about. I mean, think about it. Like if, if this is the only way that you can cope with something, maybe you should take it slowly. But why is skin picking so rare if it's a response to avoidance? Even avoidance, I imagine, is not so rare. Yeah, like I said, avoidance is not at all rare. But and picking is also not as rare as you might think. I, uh, in one of the earliest webinars, I was presenting some stats because that was the topic was something about like research and studies into skin picking. And it's like every fifth person, I think it's skin picking or hair pulling. Don't hold me to it because I don't I don't reread these studies very often. Uh, every fifth person will experience an episode in their lifetime. So it's not at all that rare. And another thing is just the people, there's a lot of shame surrounding it. And it's not one of those exotic research topics that people dream about winning the Nobel Prize once they figure out. So then it kind of gets left out and it's not talked about. And then on the other hand, we all have very individual experiences. So a, a choice of symptom, and use that word choice loosely, so not consciously, obviously, um, a choice of symptoms comes from our personal experiences. If you remember what Kelly said, that we choose based on what our experiences allow, allow us to conceptualize. So some people will grow up with different constructs, with different ways of seeing the world, so they will have different choices, and hence they will have different symptoms as well. I remember I often used to joke with a friend of mine, uh, we come from like two different parts of Europe, and then we when we sometimes joke is that basically, you know, if the world ends, I'll just get depressed and she'll be extremely anxious because of how different our experiences are, and then we have different choices. So our symptoms, our preferred symptoms, would be different. So it comes from your experience somewhere. Will this recording be shared with us after the webinar? Yes, you get all the recordings in two parts, the theoretical part and then the Q&A separately. Because when we upload a two and a half hour video, it's not easy to watch. Is it possible to deal with picking without really knowing what you're avoiding? Um, if you're asking me whether you have to like deep, dig deep down into your childhood and then kind of find that aha moment and have an insight and transform yourself magically, you don't have to. It's certainly a wonderful way to work, but it, you really don't have to. Uh, eliminating avoidance is not necessarily even about reclaiming lost memories or something like this. It's a very much in the moment strategy. A lot of acceptance and commitment therapy is informed by mindfulness and Buddhist psychology in general. Um, I mean, obviously kind of translated to our Western language, but it doesn't necessarily tell you you have to go back into the past. It's just about facing the experiences that are happening right now. I've been picking and pulling hair for 45 years. I'm bald and have many scars. I feel it's hardwired and don't know how to change. Well, therapy might be a good start. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I guess this is also another example. Is like I don't know if you always felt that it was hardwired, but sometimes when when behavior is so stubborn and persistent and it lasts for such a long time, we often reach for these ideas like that's just who I am, like that's just it, because it seems like it cannot be defeated. So I don't know much about your issue, obviously, because you wrote two sentences here, um, but. We have evidence, statistical evidence, to suggest that habit reversal works, acceptance and commitment therapy works, some other forms of CBT also work. So we know that psychotherapy overall will help. So you can consider the program or just find the local therapist and then maybe work with them. There's, there are also medical options as well. You can find that one of the early webinars that we did, it's on our channel. Uh, I kind of spelled out different studies there and compare different types of medication and stuff like this. So maybe you can get some ideas there. 
Could you go back to the four step slide we went through? It? Yeah, I'm sorry that I went through it so quickly. Um, yeah, let me, oops, let me see if I can, um, I hope you can see it now. Uh, I'm sorry we went through it quickly because at that moment I looked at my phone to see how long I've been talking and I realized that I've been yapping on for over an hour. So I thought, oh my God, I'm, I'm taking up too much of their time. So that's why, here you go. The slide is here. Uh, I have been a skin picker since the age of nine. I do not even know specific emotions that I'm avoiding. How can I identify these? So I think I gave you some tips there uh, during the, when I was answering previous, uh, sorry, my mind blanked, uh, when I was answering previous questions. Is it possible to rewatch the webinar? Yes. Uh, how do you approach someone that you might think has a skin picking disorder? Is there a respectful and compassionate way to ask if they need help? Um, well, this is always a very tricky question, especially because skin picking carries so much, uh, so much shame and so much guilt. So chances are, especially if, if, if this person's surroundings don't react very well to their problem, chances are someone has shamed them for it before. So I guess it depends on a person, but maybe it's better if you don't just kind of go up front with it, but create an environment where this person can, uh, where they can open up to you. Maybe it's a better way to ask how they feel if you notice that they've been picking rather than to say, ha, huh, you've been picking. And then if they kind of start opening up, you can encourage them to talk. Especially if this, I don't know the age of the person in question, but uh, adolescents tend to be very sensitive. And if, especially if you're a parent, that's really very difficult because it's hard to kind of get the message across that you care. They usually have their own filters for it, like the, their own constructs. If it's an adult and if it's someone you're not terribly close with, but like a, just a good friend, then I would rather create a kind of open environment where they can open up themselves and then tell me instead of me asking. If it's a child, then it is it is helpful to find find a way to talk directly to them. But focus on their feelings and their mood and something like this. Or maybe you can share something rather vague, which would be like, you know, like I'm getting a, a different kind of vibe from you today or something like, like whatever will open the emotional conversation around it. Because the the, the important thing is to send across a message that the person will not be judged. And the way that we send this message is not always verbal. That's the, I think, the key thing. Sometimes people will say all the right things, but their body language will say something differently and then no one will actually believe them. Uh, do you think that in some cases avoidance could be associated with self-preservation instinct? Oh yes, absolutely. Yes, I think very often. In fact, there are some people who write about acceptance and commitment therapy that make that connection quite clearly. Uh, there, if I go back, because I kind of mixed in a little bit of constructivism with acceptance and commitment therapy here, just make my, to kind of enrich it a little bit. Uh, but what, let's use a panic attack because this is quite a, a good example, I think, for this. One of the things that people will often report when they have panic attacks is that they feel like they're going to die. So that's like part of the of the clinical presentation of the problem itself is that once the fear starts, you feel like you will die. Your heart is racing. You feel like you're having a heart attack. You can't breathe. You feel like you're going to die and so on. So th that kind of lays bare that there is an underlying assumption that this is so intense that it will kill me. And so yes, absolutely. Avoidance would then be a means of self-preservation because if what you anticipate is death, of course you're going to avoid. Like if there's one thing that's universal source of threat, it's death because it's just the overall end. So I absolutely agree with you, yeah. Uh, is there somewhere I could find some facts, uh, fact-based evidence studies providing that the program works numerically or statistically? So there are some stats on the SkinPick website, if that's what you're asking for, about some results that our clients achieve. Overall, the, the, the folks from SkinPick, because I don't own the company, I'm just a therapist, um, 
they haven't published anything in peer-reviewed journals because that would break some confidentiality rules. Like we cannot use your data for anything, including this. So we can have this kind of overall statistics, but for any detailed analysis, we would have to, it would be a, a very complicated thing to do a, a study like this for a company. However, so you have, the program is based on two types of psychotherapy, on habit reversal training and acceptance and commitment therapy. Uh, both of these have been validated to work for uh, skin picking. So there is science that these kinds of therapies work. And then a different thing is uh, that it's an online program, so in writing. And there is there are two studies that come to my mind now. There might be more now, but last I checked, there were two that show that internet-based interventions work for skin picking and hair pulling. So when you kind of cross these two together, you get all the components of our program. Can there be multiple issues that trigger skin picking, such as perfectionism, avoidance, self-harm? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, so every time when I'm talking about skin picking from a certain perspective, I rarely mean to imply that that's all there is to it, because unfortunately, humans are not that simple. Uh, depends, I guess, for each person, a different component might be more important. And also from a constructivist point of view, um, the way that we will con construe skin picking in working with our clients, it's to find a construction of it that will be helpful to the client. One of the, like, if you've been attending the webinars for a while, you know that I have a lot of respect for psychoanalysis. In fact, I, after constructivism, I think psychoanalysis as a system is something that I find incredibly impressive and the depth and richness of thought remarkable. But there's one thing about psychoanalysis that I really, really dislike which is that they don't have this thing that constructivists have. And I think even strict CBT therapists don't also have it. They all assume that their idea about a problem is true. So like in psychoanalysis, if I interpret something and you say, dude, that's just not it. I just assume that you're resisting and therefore I'm right. And if you accept what I say, well, obviously I'm also right. And in CBT also, they have these kind of ideas like what's irrational, uh, you know, and, and then it's very easy to write off people's experiences as just another example of them being irrational. I really don't like this because for me, the way, at least from a constructivist point of view, the way we conceptualize a problem is the way this problem helps the client. If you prefer to think of skin picking in terms of perfectionism, you might enjoy the next webinar, obviously, since that will be the topic. But then for me, it's much easier to follow your trail and find and see sort of what the implications are and see maybe perfectionism actually offers a better solution because from a constructivist point of view, it's not about what's essentially true, but what works. And in therapy, the goal of therapy is like to reduce the problem or to eliminate the problem or reconstruct the problem, whatever leads to that and kind of ends, ends up you know, with you having a better cost benefit kind of ratio, then it works. If thinking of it in terms of avoidance works, good, let's go there. If it works in its perfectionism, let's go there. Usually when you have this back and forth with clients, you will kind of settle on what is the best explanation. But I don't believe in imposing explanations on other people. This is why I'm, or at least I hope I'm careful enough to kind of emphasize that this is a pattern that might be useful for you, but if it's not, then don't use it. I believe diagnostically it's not considered as self-harm. Is this a term you can use to describe skin picking informally or is it just a body repetitive behavior? So I would never use the word self-harm to describe skin picking because like you noted there, skin picking isn't self-harm. However, that doesn't mean that sometimes there's no overlap, especially when there's, when you have kind of comorbidities, especially when skin picking overlaps with, um, I don't know, let's say body dysmorphia or borderline personality disorder, where self-harm can be one aspect. Sometimes the boundaries are a little bit blurred, but that's a, like a more of a diagnostic issue than anything else. If I was, if I were explaining skin picking to a lay person or someone who knows nothing about it, I would never present it as self-harm because self-harm has its own prejudicial baggage that comes along. And I think it might give the wrong impression. But if for you personally, it makes sense to think about skin picking as self-harm, 
then this is definitely something to explore because it speaks about what it means to you. But when explaining it to other people, I would stick to these kind of general categories that psychiatry has, like body-focused repetitive behavior. Because it, like literally the definition tells you everything someone needs to know on the side about it. Like they will understand what it is. Uh, when I experience difficult emotions, I have learned to detach from them and let them pass. Is this a form of avoidance? My answer really hinges on what you mean by the word detach. Um, we talk about uh, cognitive diffusion, for example, in cognitive behavioral therapy. It's a very useful technique, in spite of what I just said critically of CBT. CBT techniques are really very useful. So in, in that way, um, if you're talking about kind of creating a little bit of space between the emotion and you, then this is just a way to handle emotions. But if you're talking about actually dissociating from it, then that is avoidance. Because letting go of an emotion or distancing by rephrasing or diffusing or whatever you want to call it from CBT doesn't mean that you don't experience it. It just means that you create a separation between who you are and what you're experiencing right now. Like I could be experiencing anger, but I'm not an angry person. So if I'm just experiencing anger, then I can watch anger come and go. So that's what letting go means. Even when you meditate and when you talk about letting go, I sometimes think that phrase is a little imprecise. I've seen some teachers, uh, well, some of my old meditation teachers who use the term let, letting things be instead of letting go. And I find that it's definitely more accurate because if you're angry, you, you're letting anger be. Like it's still there and it will go away whenever it chooses to go away. But you can then make a choice based on your values or based on your core constructs or however you theoretically phrase it. The anger is just there. It's kind of like when you have a headache, but you still have to go to work and talk to people. Like the headache is there, but you don't really focus on it. You're experiencing it, but it's not what you choose to work with. That's what letting go means. So then you decide whether or not it's, it's avoidance. How did you come to these areas of work, skin picking, emotional avoidance, and so on? Well, I'm a therapist, so skin picking is obviously one of the things that therapists work with. Specifically, why I started working so much with BFRPs is because I had some clients. Well, specifically, I was working in a psychiatric hospital at the time, and there was one client that was basically given to me because I was the youngest physician, and then you don't get to choose who you work with. And technically, I think. People just didn't know what to do with this client. And it was a client with trichotillomania. And then I just felt, thought, okay, so now I have to learn how to work with this. And then it kind of started opening up this whole world for me. And then I became interested in then, you know, one patient or client recommends another and another. And then the next thing you know, that's a good part of my, of my work. Uh, but in general, how I came to psychotherapy, that's a very long story. <laughs> when we talk about some sort of psychoanalysis here, then I'll give you that as an example. Um, I guess the short answer is because of all the things that I knew how to do or were I could kind of conceptualize and see myself doing, psychotherapy was by far the most fulfilling one. And it's one of those rare choices that I never doubt. Sometimes it's hard, but I never think it was the wrong choice. Um, once you become aware of your thoughts and emotions while picking, does the picking necessarily automatically stop? If not, what, we, what can we do to stop it? Um, so that really depends. I would say mostly no, but sometimes yes, because once you're able to become aware of a thought and, or an emotion and just kind of label it as a thought or as an emotion or rephrase it if, with session six, if you're in program or because it's hard, and I don't know what other resources to recommend for this that are not technical books. But so if you use any of the ways to kind of slightly detach yourself from, from what you and observe instead of just being overwhelmed, you always kind of give yourself a little bit of a cushion so it can help to stop. But what you should do at least in the beginning is find a competing response or a stimulus control technique that works. But for what you described here, I would just find competing responses. You can Google these or simply take a look at the last month's webinar where we talked about that a little more. It was about habit reversal. Just one second.
do you find that there is a specific type of person who picks any similarities between clients? Um, well, I don't believe that in types of people. I, one uh, part of the baggage that comes with being a constructivist is that you don't like to classify people as belonging to a type because it kind of centralizes them. But there are common themes that I see. They're always slightly different. They're not always the same, but people will use the same language to describe them. So avoidance would obviously be a major theme. Then another one would be perfectionism. That's quite common. Uh, I often see that people don't have a lot of self-compassion, that they're incredibly hard on themselves and genuinely don't know how to be any different. Like when I mention self-compassion to people, they're like, okay, what is it? And then I explain and they're like, what do you mean to be nice to myself? Like this, this is something that I get quite often. So these would be some of the themes that that repeat themselves. And if, there are also some themes that are often sort of found with people in general at VFRBs. Like for example, people who pull their hair, in, in my experience, often have traumatic experiences in the past, but this doesn't mean everyone is just a theme that I've seen repeat itself. And I have no studies to back that up. This is literally just my observation. I'd like to sign up for the program. Uh, I, don't, I don't understand the setup very well. Is it only an eight week program, but we pay monthly. So you pay monthly and you can stay in the program as long as you like, and, but there are eight sessions that you can open at the fastest rate, one per week. And then once, but most people choose to do it slower because it's quite intense. And then once you finish those eight sessions, there are some additional ones that you can use. If you possibly can, I would suggest that you tune in to the short webinar next week once you get the email and then you will get the overview of the entire program. I will also explain like how you communicate with the therapist about what, how often, you know, what assignments you have and these things in a little in, in details. But yeah, you don't have to limit yourself to eight weeks. You can stay longer. Basically until you cancel the subscription. Uh, is there any particular suggestion, suggestion you would give as an alternative to picking that can be done with one's hands? Oh yeah, many of them. So um, infinity cubes, fidget spinners, uh, uh, what's the word? spinner rings. Um, then the other day I learned there's something called, uh, um, I forgot. But anyway, spinner rings, acupressure rings, um, uh, worry stones, worry bracelets, um, rosaries. Um, I'm handling, I have this on my hands, it's like mala beads because they almost fell off the table. So I'm holding them in my hands. This is also useful to play with if you're anxious. Um, I don't have anything near me. Usually I keep competing responses close by so that I can show them to people, but those are some things that came to my mind. Um, if the sensory aspect of it is important to you, then I would suggest maybe, um, Maybe using um, worry stones or or just finding textures that feel nice to touch and then play with. But for more suggestions, go to habit reversal training webinar. I think we discussed this at length there. Uh, the sustainable narratives slide. Can you explain that how to carry these out? So this is something that you would let's say consciously uh, consciously construct. Once you learn how to open up to these unpleasant experiences, so once you get a little more empirical data about what is it that you need to construct a narrative on, it's like in science, you don't, uh, you don't create a theory out of thin air. You need empirical data, something that you need to explain, like a problem. And then once you kind of are able to mindfully and deal with the, the emotions, then you can start creating a narrative. By sustainable, what I mean, is that it provides what it needs to provide. So it needs to help you cope. It so it needs to include something very practical, whether it's mindfulness or a competing response, or I don't know, calling a friend, talking to yourself, just giving yourself a pat on the back, whatever works for you. So it has to have this technical part, like a practical part. And then it also needs to preserve something from the old narrative. Because remember, our psyche is always functional. So everything does something. However damaging our old ideas are about ourselves or the world, they did perform a function. Otherwise, they wouldn't have stayed that long. It's kind of like the government. Like 
when you go around the world, different governments have different faults, but the reason why they all stay and don't fall every two days, or at least most countries they don't, is because they do something and they provide something. And this is incredibly important in politics to understand is like, what is it you need to offer to your voters so that they stay with you even when you do crazy things? So that's very important. And our narratives always have that. Uh, so if skin picking is the only way to sell suit, like the only way you know, then it doesn't matter how damaging it is, it will sustain itself because it does this and nothing else does. Right, so it's like when you have monopoly on the market, like if one company sells, I remember the first time I went to Cuba, it was, it was a while ago when there were far less foreign products in Cuba. And then I went to the supermarket to buy the deodorant and you know, there was one. And I was like, anything else to offer? And they were like, mm, that's the deodorant we use. I was like, one, you know, because you know, a couple of dozen miles up north, you go into a store and there's like a row of deodorants. And because when you when you have like one company making all of it, then you can't choose. You're basically dependent on that product unless you want to stink, but most people don't. So the same goes for our narratives. For if you have one explanation for things, one resource for something, you're absolutely dependent on it. So this is why these damaging old narratives sustain themselves or to use Kelly's terms, this is why constructs stay in function. So you need to be very careful in realizing what is it that it does for you. And then once you realize what it does, you need to come up with a healthier alternative. So it, it literally is like placing a product on the market. Like you need to satisfy basic needs and make it slightly better. So that's, that's the way to approach it. This is why I said that you should never throw out the old idea of the window because there are parts of it that are still functional. You know, if avoidance is meant to spare you some suffering, then sparing yourself from suffering is actually a compassionate idea. You just need to find a practical, um, practical, healthier way to go about it. So it's an operational question. I hope that makes sense. And when we talk about perfectionism, I can add some some parts about sort of how to work with perfectionism and apply this approach so that I make it a little easier. Uh, let me see, what else? Uh, the artwork that you use really helps me understand the concepts. Thank you for sharing. It inspires me to use art in my life. Well, thank you. Just the other day, someone told me, it's like, why do you use all this creepy art? Just use the text and I thought, what would be the point of having a presentation without art? Thank you, you just made my day. <laughs> I will frame this. Uh, does skin picking ever go away? Um, that's a complex question. In general, I can say yes, but in reality, even if you stop picking, like the urge to pick, like, like I said before, like a, a sustainable way to look at emotions is as information. So if that's your body's way of communicating something to you, it's likely going to keep using that way. So you, you, so hypothetically, there is a chance that let's say if you manage to stop picking entirely or reduce it to some, let's say clinically insignificant measure, something that you're fine with, there is a chance that when you experience something very stressful and very difficult, that this might be the type of behavior that you revert to. Not because it's in any way superior to whatever else you introduce in your life, but because, well, old habits die hard. When something was validated as, let's say, a way of soothing for so, so long, it kind of stays like in the back of your mind. So you may have to be extra cautious in stressful periods. But yeah, so that, that would be, I guess, the shortest way to explain it without going into unnecessary detail. I already answered this question. Thank you, you're welcome. Um, uh, the Q&A sessions are very helpful. It's better than reading. Oh, well, thank you. But I don't know what is it you were trying to read, but by all means, read on. Um, so, well, thank you. I don't know what else to say. And I'm glad that I can help. I'm always confused when I get compliments. Like if people criticize me, I'm Usually, like, let's figure out how to make it better and see if I can do something. But then there's a compliment. So, I'm like, I don't know. I, I feel like a child sometimes with these things. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. 
Is the Q&A section included in the recording? There are some really useful questions being posed. Yeah, you're really on a roll with questions today. I'm, I'm really impressed. They really make me think. Yeah, so it's included, but it's a separate file because otherwise it, you would just end up with like a two hour recording. Uh, I often make goals for myself based on things I want to change in my life, but I often find myself not sticking with them. Perhaps this is avoidance. What suggestions do you have to deal with this? Uh, this could be avoidance, but we don't have to reduce everything in the world to avoidance. Uh, sometimes when we make goals for ourselves, we make the goals based on what we think we should need, which is not necessarily what we actually need. Uh, that's one thing. And the, this discrepancy can often make us quit something because there's no like intrinsic motivation for it. And then a lot of the times, the resistance can manifest itself this way. And I think I've talked about this a few times in the context of mindfulness, because this is where I see it most often, is that people will be very enthusiastic about meditation and they will buy like 25 books about mindfulness. And I don't know, like they will download every interview that a Dalai Lama ever gave. And I don't know, like they'll just gather a lot of resources. Uh, they will enthusiastically meditate for a week and then slowly they will stop. And the reason for this is, and it doesn't feel like it, but it usually is resistance. Meaning that first you realize that it's not as easy as it seems, that it's much easier to read about it than to actually do it because it really brings you in touch with all the stuff that you try to avoid. And then saying, well, I forgot, or I don't have time. Like when people tell me I don't have time to meditate for 10 minutes, it's really hard to keep my face straight. Like, we spend more time scrolling through Instagram, even if we don't use it a lot per day. So it can also be resistance. But I guess for purposes of this conversation, yes, it can also be a form of avoidance, like not wanting to, to follow through with the consequences or maybe the implications of what you're, what you're trying to do are not always good. Because even uh, sometimes even what seemingly logically is entirely good, I don't know, like doing yoga, like there's no harm in in doing physical exercise that is also very gentle. But then let's say relaxation also is something that logically doesn't say that it's bad, but people who have a lot of uh, desire to control things, for example, sometimes don't think relaxing is really actually very good. They will say, I wish I could relax, but because sometimes relaxing implies letting go of control, they're not going to be meditating too much because it implies that they will let go of control that this is something like a very core issue and they just can't part with it. So they will find an excuse, say something like, you know, genetically I'm not able to relax, let's move on. So the implications of something that superficially may say, um, uh, may seem to be logical, may not be psychologically for us the best thing. Uh, why does it say my name, others say anonymous? Yes, I don't really, I'm like, I, I've learned to use Skype from this side so I don't know how you anonymize your name, but you can do that. And you can also change your name to say anything you like. It's somewhere in the options. I'm sorry, I don't know it's on top of my head how to do that. But I'm not going to read your name, so it should be okay. Uh, okay, I answered this question. Uh, what's the name of the article on constructivism that you mentioned? I mentioned an article specifically about anger management. It's called the Tuesday Group. I believe if it's an article by Peter Cummings, it might be on academia to download for free. Um, I think I also have it, although I'm not sure if it's printed or in, or in PDF or in a Word file because I got it from the author of one of the workshops that he did. If you're interested in it, email me and I'll see if I have it. And you can also email him, he's a very nice man and I'm sure he will share it. It's called a Tuesday Club. It's his experience of working in an anger management group. And there's also a whole book that's a little more technical and detailed. Uh, if you're looking for articles about constructivism in general, my God, there's tons of stuff that I can recommend. Um, is all of this stuff we go through, go through ultimately just about learning to cope with life and living and finding helpful rather than harmful strategies? Well, I think our entire psyche, not just our problems are really geared towards learning how to cope with life. I, 
I, I dare say that this is something that most psychotherapists, like we all have different theoretical perspectives and sometimes we butt heads and argue and fight. But I think this is something most of us could agree with, yeah. From a constructivist perspective, our entire psychology is really a way to, to successfully anticipate events and interact with the world. So yeah, all of it is about adapting and, and trying to live a fulfilling life. Uh, okay, let's select a few random questions because there's quite a number of them. Uh, and I'm not sure that I will have the voice to answer more of them. Are the sessions reimbursed by some insurances? By some, yes. So you have to contact the specific insurer you have. What are your thoughts about BFRBs currently being categorized under OCD and DSM? In what ways do you see that as being useful or not useful? Um, I have to be quite honest and say that I don't quite care how things are classified because uh, to me, the DSM is just a helpful way to talk about problems. Like it's like we find these entities and then we just name them and then it's easy to communicate. But I don't think it says much about you as a person or your personal struggles. It's very impersonal in that way. Uh, so. OCD and, and BFRBs share some neurobiological aspects, let's say, in common. I spoke about this in one of the previous webinars also. There are some studies that show that certain, certain parts of the brain, let's say, are activated in a similar way. So not to go into details now, in both OCD and hair pulling and skin picking. So they share some similarities, but they are not the same thing. Even in DSM, it's not the same diagnosis. They're just kind of related. Like, let's say they, they're on the same spectrum, but they're not the exact same thing. I, I find that uh, OCD is, is a frequent co-occurring condition with skin picking, around something around 30%. So like if you, have, if you struggle with skin picking, one in three is a chance that you will also have some OCD symptoms. That's the thing with these classifications. They're never black and white. There's a lot of overlap especially when you get to the emotional disorders, it's a complete mess. Like it's, it's very difficult to make heads and tails out of. So I don't, other than for insurance purposes or prescribing medication, I don't think it's really important. Because e even if the DSM says they're entirely separate, they're, they're the same, practically what matters is whether or not you have both. That's, that's and whether some strategies, let's say from OCD treatments can be helpful for us, but we can try these even if if they're not officially classified together. Like if you study the history of these, these systems of classification, both DSM and ICD, you will see that there's a lot of moving around. With like when the studies show, or it's like, like as we learn more, we kind of adjust them, but it doesn't, most of the time it doesn't affect treatment significantly. Sometimes it does, but here it really doesn't. So it's inconsequential as far as I'm concerned. Uh, let's select one more. You speak with a lot of wisdom that feels very real to me compared to previous therapists. Are all skin pick trick stop therapists trained like you? Can you be my therapist? Um, I think you can maybe request me as a therapist, but you better write to our support. Let me go back to this screen here, the last one. So you have the email for our support team, so you can ask them any of these technical questions. Uh, all of our therapists are trained to deal with skin picking. So all of them, like we don't employ people who don't know how to treat skin, treat skin picking. Other therapists might have slightly different approaches than me. We're not clones of each other. Um, so they might not use the exact same words as I do, but all of them have experience with skin picking and all of them know how to do their job. I'm, I'm happy with the, with the team, really. So the answer to your question, uh, yes, they should all be good at their jobs. And also, thank you for calling me wise. I don't get that very often. Uh, is switching from various forms of skin picking. I currently chew the inside of my cheeks. Also, does anyone else have the ritual of cleaning and over sanitizing? Yeah, there are a lot of rituals that can be attached to the process of skin picking. Sometimes these rituals are helpful in therapy, other times they're not. 
But yes, like especially when it lasts for a long time, then in order to maintain the, the behavior, people will attach all kinds of stuff to them. This is especially, I think, visible for hair pulling, not so much for skin picking, where there's this incredible amount of rituals that can be attached to the end of hair pulling, like chewing the hair, leaking the hair, like playing in the mouth, rubbing it, arranging it in a certain order. So a lot of these things can be attached to the act of picking or pulling itself, sure. And also sometimes uh, you can, I'm not sure what you meant by switching your question, but sometimes you, you also, over the years, you will switch to different forms of BFRBs. So people will sometimes have skin picking and hair pulling, then come back to skin picking, or they will change the picking sites. I like to ask about this because sometimes there are regularities about which parts of your body you pick and when and why. Not always, but sometimes. And then there was another example earlier tonight here that this person said about her child that she used to, I believe, uh, uh, have thumb sucking and then it kind of went to skin picking and into hair pulling. Um, so yeah, this is, this is something that happens quite frequently. I like to examine these in therapy if the clients are, uh, if the clients are willing, of course, because I think these things can reveal a lot because why change the picking site, for example? Like there has to be a logic behind that. Sometimes it's shame. And then you can see how over the years picking moves to more invisible places, which I think shows sometimes a, a worrying trend in the sense that there's a lot of effort to hide the behavior, not so much to change it, but just to hide it from people. And then in some other instances, picking sites are actually quite relevant. And also like with hair pulling, uh, sometimes people will, switch to pulling their like pubic hair from their hair. And then sometimes it will be availability, sometimes it will be to hide it, but sometimes it will actually have quite meaningful roots. Like it will be really related to something like trauma or whatever other types of experiences. So this is something definitely to consider in therapy, but it's not something that you have to automatically assume, the, assume is terribly relevant. At the end of the day, what's relevant in therapy is what gives us useful information to resolve the problem, not necessarily what the most sensational story is. Uh, okay, so there's still 14 questions that I didn't get to. I, I apologize to everyone, but we do have to stop here. So you can email me your questions to me or to our technical support. So our therapists also answer questions uh, from from the tech support email as well, but you can reach me specifically on the email that's on the left. Um, I hope to to be able to talk to you again in January, and we will be talking about perfectionism. So yeah, also stay tuned for the webinar about the program if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, I hope you have a pleasant evening, and if I don't have a chance to communicate with you before New Year's and Christmas, then Merry Christmas, Happy New Year and anything else that you might celebrate in between and have a pleasant evening. Bye.